Amy, I'm so glad you're with us today. You are one of the most incisive minds when it comes to neuroscience, kind of a sharp machete when it comes to slicing through a lot of the obfuscation and uh, almost mythology that surrounds what neuroscience can tell us or can't tell us about, about social problems. But over the last 15 years or so, neuroscience has been applied outside of the lab to a lot of different uh, social questions. Can you just give us an overview of that before we get into your, the work you've done recently? Well, I think uh, attempts to extrapolate the significance of neuroscience, apply it to uh, social problems and social life has really run the gamut. Uh, everything from uh, lie detection to competence, certainly in my area of law, uh, individuals' competence, competence to stand trial, to uh, be punished, to be held responsible. Uh, there's an enormous literature now on the pertinence of neuroscience to criminal responsibility and civil responsibility, and that's been an extensive area of inquiry. Uh, addiction is another topic uh, where neuroscientists have weighed in and claim to have insights. Uh, so that's extremely important as well. Uh, lie detection, uh, evidentiary issues, um, people's reliability as witnesses, uh, at people's ability yeah. to process so information. Is, a lot of it goes in on the, and on. In the legal uh, <laughs> in, right. In, I'm, I'm mostly acquainted the with realm. the legal realm, and I think that's yeah. where there, that has been a hot spot, right. most definitely. Uh, but this paper is really about something else. Right, and th this mm -hmm. paper it has a wonderful name called the, the Poverty of the Neuroscience of Poverty. And uh, it's about what neuroscience, what the brain, what correlations between the brain and, and the mind mm -hmm. can tell us about the effects of deprivation on children and to, I guess to some extent adults, but it mostly focuses on children, Correct. is that right? Correct. So Developmental, it's really become a branch of uh, developmental <coughs> uh, science, mm -hmm. shall we say, generically, uh, all the way from behavioral science to neuroscience, really, it lies on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. So when people study, as you put it, p brains on poverty, mm -hmm. what is it that they're looking at exactly? What kinds of questions are they asking? Right. Um, well, I, I like to think of this body of literature as um, attempting to create a three-way uh, linkage or three-way correspondence. Um, first of all, we have the general observation that uh, some children and obviously adults in society are in various ways disadvantaged, uh, and that in, is, is in, in itself a sort of complex construct. That disadvantage tends to correlate with or is linked with, in children, various uh, deficits or disabilities or difficulties uh, in all sorts of um, functions, behavioral, cognitive, and non-cognitive functions. And so those have been fairly well documented, anything from memory to verbal processing uh, to impulse control, executive function, uh, visuospatial capacities, uh, lots of different research on this in the behavioral realm. And then there is this separate uh, body of work now that could rightly be called neuroscience. And this consists of efforts mostly to take pictures of and scan and look at the morphology and the function of brains of children uh, who have been exposed to various uh, disadvantages, including poverty, but also other uh, social uh, disadvantages. and look and see how their brains differ from uh, so-called average or normal children's brains. And the techniques that have you been used really are threefold. The first is so-called static magnet magnetic resonance imaging, which is focused on looking at brain structures, mm -hmm. density, size, the kind of neuroanatomical features of these brains. Uh, the second is functional MRI, which also takes a picture, but sees the brain in its dynamic aspect, uh, focuses in on the energy that is used by various portions of the brain when functions are performed. 
Uh, so it's a kind of real-time picture of the brain, fMRI that's called. And then there are uh, techniques, it's a minor part of the literature, looking at evoked signals, uh, so-called ERPs, uh, that are detected on the outside of the brain when the individuals are performing various functions like listening, reading, looking, uh, attempting to memorize material and the like. So that, that is really the kind of neuroscience piece of uh, the neuroscience of poverty. And these, most of the studies or many of the studies now are attempting to link up the social deficit history with the functional behavioral difficulties and the pictures of the brain that go with them. It's, I, it's kind of a three-legged stool uh, in many cases. This, this body of work um, really examines all these parameters and tries to uh, create correspondences among them. Right, so the, the, the neural correlates, as, as it's called. You know, it's if, neural if a, correlates. If a, mm -hmm. if a kid has problems with impulse control, how, can, how does that manifest in the frontal lobes and, and, other, right. mm -hmm. and other regions? Uh, but what, so what is, I mean, we've learned a lot about functional magnetic imaging over the, t over the years, and, and there was a phase of what I would call the localization phase Correct. where uh, people, as you said, people would perform a task and something would light up. You know, we've certainly moved largely past that in terms of trying to think about behavior. Mm -hmm. And an emphasis now is, is uh, much greater emphasis is on the way the uh, various regions of the brain connect with each other. Correct. So I assume that would have pretty significant implications for the kind of but still seems to be localization efforts that people who were doing brains on poverty, um, the kinds of limitations that are then uh, attached to some of their findings. Well, what's interesting, I think, about this literature, which you know, in many respects is, is very rudimentary, I would even call yeah. it primitive, uh, is that it hasn't really moved beyond the localization phase. Now, a lot of the work it builds on is this painstaking neuroanatomical and neurofunctional work that has been done in animals and also in humans that locates particular functions in particular centers. So let's say emotion. There's, there are a number of papers in literature that look at emotional volatility as uh, an accompaniment of, of dis disadvantage. And of course, we know emotion is is uh, centered in the amygdala and in the hippocampus. There's a lot of work on the frontal lobes and the higher cerebral areas and how important that is to executive function. But what there isn't a lot of, certainly in the neuroscience of deprivation area, is work that attempts in a sophisticated way to connect up areas of the brain and see how they interact. Really, we're at the phase of just trying to look locally. And there are reasons for that. The reasons really are, I think, uh, tied to the, the difficulty of doing these studies, it, the difficulties of doing them are tremendous. I mean, you have to uh, do science on children uh, and scan children, test children. Tell, say uh, what a scanner makes you do. To, yeah, to so if, in order to, to scan children, uh, children in poverty, in order to look carefully at their brain, uh, these children, some of whom are, are very, very young, uh, have to be slid into this enormous machine with a very, very small uh, compartment uh, where they need to remain uh, very still. Uh, they can't move um, for a very long time and they have to cooperate, of course, with the researcher. Uh, and this is extremely difficult to accomplish uh, and it's hard to get any reliable data set out of this. I mean, little children uh, need to be sedated. Uh, very often they won't just cooperate spontaneously. So as you can imagine, accumulating data points here is, is a very lengthy, time-consuming, arduous task. On top of that, you have all of the procedural safeguards and hurdles to doing studies on children, of course, and the Ethics parents. Ethics review boards, you mean. <clears throat> institutional review boards, which have to approve and review every single study. Uh, it's a very cumbersome process. So this really slows down uh, the research in this area and it limits what can be looked at. Mm -hmm. but, so, but when they do look at something, and that's 
mainly the kind of data in a sense you get. It's, it's a visual right. representation. It's a look. It, it tell, I mean, at the, at the most, and, and this is not trivial information <clears throat> when it's well done, but the most you can get is a correlation. Correct. Um, so I think, you know, I am not claiming that these are not valuable studies or areas of inquiry, and obviously we have to start somewhere, so uh, here's where we start. Uh, but when you boil it all down, when you come right down to it, uh, all this literature really consists of is a set of correlations, a set of correlations between fairly simple observations of a very sophisticated organ, to be sure, uh, looking at function and structure of brains and comparing uh, brains of children to one another, and that's a lot, but at the end of the day, it's just a picture, and correlating that with life histories, which are quite complex and not very standardized, and the way that these life histories are uh, summarized varies across studies, of course, and then an attempt to look at behavioral and functional deficits in the very same children. So that in itself poses difficulties since it does rely on getting good data and having children who cooperate with the program. Uh, so that, that is essentially uh, the terrain that we're operating in here with the neuroscience of poverty. Right, and if you, if you can't separate cause <coughs> from correlation, which we cannot do at this point, that, that really kind of puts a big monkey wrench in any kind of policy agenda one of has. Of course, of course. So really, I'm, I make two main points in my paper about this literature. First, of course, I describe the literature and sort of all the methodological uh, obstacles and problems that it tended, and they are legion, uh, and I've, I've hinted at some of those. But the main problems, I think, here and, and the, what leads to the misuse and the overclaiming surrounding this literature are, is twofold. First of all, there's the causation problem. So if you look at this literature, the, the implicit assumption seems to be that if we see deficits both in the brain and in behavior uh, in children in poverty, then the cause of those deficits, both in brain and behavior, must be the poverty, that is, must be these externals, these environmental influences, the disadvantage that we're all so concerned with in our society has to be what causes it. Now, the correlate of that is that if we could just somehow correct or cure or remove that disadvantage or alleviate it, then these deficits would disappear. That will be sort of the solution to the problem, uh, and that follows right out of the correlation. And this literature is almost exclusively concerned with prevention rather than cure after the fact. Obviously, regardless of the cause, if we had some kind of magic pill or bullet that would reverse these effects, it wouldn't re really matter how they were caused, uh, but we don't have anything like that on the horizon. Now, the problem with that assumption that the external conditions of poverty are what cause these deficits is that they ignore the possibility of another set of causes or another avenue of causation, which is genetic differences or heritable differences or so-called innate differences, right? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, those innate differences are not, um, you know, fixed. There's gene environment interaction, and we know a lot about that, right? The way that genes express themselves are affected by environment, but there isn't sort of an infinite elasticity in the way that genes can be affected, so, uh, or gene expression can be affected. So, for example, if part of or some of the functional deficit that we associate or see with poverty is in fact the product of uh, innate programs that happen to be more common, difficulties, uh, genetic traits that are more common in poor people, uh, then curing poverty, that is changing social conditions, will not necessarily uh, you know, bring these kids up to speed because their difficulties are innate. Now, poverty may exacerbate these deficits, but uh, by hypothesis will not be the exclusive cause. So there is a kind of fallacy that potentially operates if we don't set, if we don't separate genetic causes, that piece from the environmental cause. And it's even more complicated because 
the genetic substratum of some of these difficulties, and we know that a lot of these behaviors and traits do have uh, genetic uh, correspondences or that there are genes that affect how learning uh, goes, memory abilities, reading abilities, and the like, those deficits can also um, operate indirectly. So how does that work? So we know that parenting is part of uh, what uh, contributes to disadvantage, poor parenting. But if your parents have some of the genetic traits that make them poor parents, those traits will be passed on to you directly. They will also affect your parents' uh, behavior. They will affect their behavior with respect to you as a parent. They will affect their behavior in terms of uh, conducting their life to try and surmount poverty or try and eliminate uh, poverty. Uh, they will affect behavior in all sorts of ways that has a secondary effect on you as a child. So there are these very complex, both primary and secondary interaction effects of environment and genes that I think this literature virtually ignores. When I say virtually, there will occasionally be lip service paid to the possibility of a genetic influence, but then in the very next paragraph, typically, uh, that will be forgotten and uh, the discussion will go off on how all of these different interventions and services and programs uh, need to be brought to bear to fix the problem, as if genetics really had nothing to do with it. But until we disentangle the innate influences, the heritable influences on conduct, behavior, personality, uh, cognitive and non-cognitive capacities, we aren't really in the position to talk about uh, which environmental manipulations will affect a change. We're, we really should not be speaking of that because we don't have the knowledge uh, to enable us to say anything with confidence. Do you detect sort of a somewhat forbidden element to, to some of the research that would pursue the genetic or in, innate dimensions? Uh, certainly with intelligence, that can be a radioactive right. undertaking. Yes, well, I think there is definitely a kind of um, backdrop, a political valence to so much of uh, this behavioral psychology uh, when we start talking about you know, what the influence of genes is. And, and there's, there's almost a, a schizophrenia here because the individuals who work certainly in the field of psychometrics, who, who were directly responsible for studying genetic inputs into behavior. Uh, those mainstream psychometricians, and they, they never doubt that there is a genetic component to a lot of these capacities. That's just a standard uh, assumption or understanding that comes out of the science. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the, certainly the popular commentary on you know, behavior and disadvantage and the like and also people who are more on the behavioral side, the purely behavioral side of developmental uh, issues, they really avoid or even outright deny uh, the influence of, of genetics or they take refuge in um, concepts like epigenetics and really misuse those concepts to try to convince us that there are no limits to what environmental manipulation can do. And of course, none of that science stands for that proposition uh, by any means. So uh, there are precincts in our society where talking about uh, the genetic determinants of abilities, capacities, uh, personality traits, character uh, is deeply unpopular and I think that's why it's avoided. I can see that. Mm -hmm. So you, you said in your paper that this has been, this kind of inquiry has been going on for about 15 years, or at least a good decade. Do, do some of the people in the field start, are starting to realize, well, there's just really a lot of limits to what we can do, or are they barreling ahead and optimistic? Well, once again, I think the, the course of people who actually do the science uh, recognize uh, that they're just at the beginning of their journey, so to speak, um, and, and then see the obstacles to uh, a more reticulated, uh, sort of finely dissected approach to the brain. 
uh, both to causation and to structure and function. I mean, they're tremendous, and yet they're still plugging ahead, trying to incrementally uh, advance the field, and I think that's just fine. Um, but, you know, they have their moments, uh, they're tempted to make these vaunting claims. I'm not sure how seriously they take those claims. Um, most, the, the most uh, exaggerated uh, claims about the significance of neuroscience are not really in the primary literature, although there are, there's a bit of offending there. Uh, it's really in the secondary literature that, you know, reviews the science and then tries to tease out its implications for policy and practice. Uh, and that includes some law review articles as well as uh, some volumes from the Institute of Medicine, from uh, poverty research institutes like the Wisconsin Institute for Research on Poverty recently did a symposium on this. The American Academy of Pediatrics issued a report uh, a year ago where they talked endlessly about um, the policy implications here. So I think it's really more of a sort of secondary spectators or consumers of this literature who are abusing it rather than the researchers okay. themselves. Oh, I, I agree with that. But are the, are the, res are the primary researchers, the, the, the bench people, uh, are they at least, and it's difficult and they're not responsible, I know this from, they're not responsible for the way other people Correct. take their work and. Although they don't discourage Well, that's it. what I was gonna ask you. Yeah, no, I don't think they're discouraging it. And I think uh, they, don't, they don't issue severe enough caveats. Uh, they're, not, they're not standing guard over the abuse of their science. And I can give an example. I actually do give an example in the paper I discuss rather extensively. The example of a large study that came out of the laboratory of Kimberly Noble in Columbia maybe about a year ago now, maybe it was the end of 2015, that got a huge amount of press. Uh, and the nidus of, of this, you know, exuberance was really in the paper itself. So what did Kimberly Noble do? She accumulated a database uh, through multi-center studies, but also from, from her own uh, lab and group of about a thousand children who were scanned. Their brains were looked at. She was specifically focused on brain size and morphology and surface area. Uh, and what she found is that children who grew up in disadvantaged environments, and she had various measures of that, um, had smaller size brains and smaller surface area in, in various brain centers that we know are correlated with uh, capacities that are diminished in deprived children. Uh, and the science, I think, was fairly sound, although there were maybe some quibbles that could be made with it. But the trouble really started in, or the trouble, I think, with that study was what she said in the discussion section. Uh, she essentially did not acknowledge or did not take seriously the potential for any genetic input into her observations. She did ironically control for ethnicity because it is known that, um, that minorities, especially blacks, do on average have smaller brains and smaller surface areas, so she had to control for, for that or her signal would have been diluted. But apart from that ethnic piece, she didn't acknowledge that there was a kind of disadvantage correlated piece that might be separate from that. She certainly um, didn't give it any play. Now, and then she went on to talk about uh, the potential for shaping public policy and uh, creating programs and services and throwing resources at the problem that might address these deficits at the inception. So she definitely nodded towards the usual set of recommendations, which is more programs, more services, more, 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 more and, and sort of top-down governmentally sponsored initiatives. So this is very much, I think, in keeping with a, a more progressive approach agenda for how to tackle poverty. Um, she was criticized by a psychologist, a very, I think, uh, august and respected psychologist named James Thompson, who has a blog with quite a following. His blog has now gone over to a more general website called The Uns Review. And in that blog called Psychological Comments, he took Kim Noble and her group to task for uh, exaggerating the implications of her findings uh, which he said 
really had no significance in the absence of some definitive study of the innate or genetic or DNA-based contribution to what she observed versus the environmental contribution. Really no serious attempt in her paper to tease out those two components. A bit of an interchange between Noble and Thompson uh, in response to this, and she did finally, albeit very grudgingly, admit uh, that she could not, based on her studies, disentangle these influences. Well, that's a good segue then into <laughs> the kinds of policy, uh, kind of uh, policy arenas in which people are trying to extrapolate this. And I'm thinking right. of the two you mentioned in your book, which is juvenile justice and uh, disabilities in, in, in children in school. Correct, correct. Um, so I don't, I don't do a lot with juvenile justice in my paper because that is a well-tilled field, uh, certainly um, in the legal area because, of course, there have been big cases in the Supreme Court pertaining to um, the death penalty for juveniles and also life without parole, cases involving life without parole. And there have been attempts to introduce neuroscience evidence, including a lot of its developmental literature uh, because uh, very often the people who are um, who commit these egregious crimes have grown up in disadvantaged circumstances and in poverty. So whatever effects, quote unquote, this has on their brain is going to have some relevance to this. Um, but obviously that is going to be an area in which uh, these developmental studies are going to have some pertinence. Um, interestingly, when it comes to responsibility, uh, the distinction between genetic causes and environmental causes isn't all that important because what's key is the bottom line. What is this person's capacity uh, to conform their conduct to the law? Uh, what is the justice or injustice uh, of punishing them in certain ways? What is the possibility of their possibly reforming their behavior or aging out of their behavior. All of that stuff, I think, uh, is really a little bit peripheral to what I am trying to address here. However, the use of developmental neuroscience uh, when it comes to learning disabilities um, and educational issues really is quite central to, to my discussion, and it's part of my quarry in this paper. So the last part of my paper is devoted to uh, an effort by a very prominent scholar, James Ryan, who is now the dean of the Harvard Education School, uh, to bring neuroscience to bear uh, on what policies we ought to have towards children with learning disabilities. Uh, his argument uh, in the paper that I take on is that neuroscience, what we know from the neuroscience of poverty, dictates that we completely change uh, the statute, the statutory uh, framework for dealing with learning disabled children. There is a statute, a federal statute, called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It's been on the books for quite a while now. And what it does is it confers the right on children with learning disabilities, all disabilities, but our quarry here is just learning disabilities, to have uh, an individualized education program created for them by public schools. Uh, that's the first tenet of it. And the second is to be relieved of certain disciplinary actions uh, that uh, might be brought to bear for their behaviors. Um, so it really does put these children in a privileged position. It confers on them the right to greater resources, to individualized education, to uh, a variance from ordinary disciplinary processes. But the statute says explicitly that the only children that are eligible for this special treatment are children who have bona fide learning disabilities that does not include disabilities due to uh, poverty or cultural or external factors. Implicitly, uh, and I think it's, it's not quite explicit, but certainly everybody has construed the statute to mean that you have to, your brain has to have been born that way. 
for you to get these special deficits. You were born somehow, or you have some innate genetic deficit in your learning ability in your brain, obviously, because the brain determines behavior, as we know. Uh, and those are the people that get special dispensation. Children who have these deficits due to poverty, they don't get the special dispensation. And Jim Ryan says, well, neuroscience teaches us that that makes no sense. That's an arbitrary distinction. Why? Because neuroscience teaches us that the poverty that children experience, they're not born with it, but they experience it in life. The disadvantage impacts their brain or affects their brain, changes, scrambles their brain, and therefore it's now written in the brain. So why distinguish between kids who are born with their deficit written in the brain and children who acquire a deficit that is written in the brain? Neuroscience teaches us that. So we should treat them the same. That is the argument. Now, apart from the sort of slippery slope that that creates, I think the main difficulty with this argument is that it may be a valid point, and I think one could, uh, one could definitely take the position that we ought to treat these children the same or give them both the same sorts of resources, but the reason he gives is completely fallacious. Neuroscience, nothing in the actual body of work in neuroscience tells us that this statute is misguided. That comes out of insights that predated the whole literature on neuroscience. So what insight am I talking about here? Well, we've known forever that genes interact with the environment, that the environment alters the expression of genes, that the potential of brains may not be realized if the environment is deprived. That's a generic understanding about the relationship between so-called genotype and phenotype, genetic endowment and behavior. We knew that for centuries before neuroscience came on the scene. And also, the argument that these children should be treated the same is not really properly a scientific argument. It is a moral argument and a practical argument. Well, what is the moral argument? The moral argument is that in neither case, deprivation-related deficits, inborn-related deficits, are these deficits the fault of the child? The child did not produce this problem. They're just, unfortunately, stuck with it. So there's no reason to give special favors to one category and not the other. We should be helping all children. But that insight comes out of something that I call biological materialism. Biological materialism tells us that whatever behavioral problems we see always have a basis in the brain. We're not going to see a change in behavior without a change in the brain. Well, we've known that forever, right? That's just generic biological materialism. 20 years ago, two legal scholars made the argument that it was unjust and unfair to treat deprived children differently from genetically impaired children. That's Mark Kelman and Jillian Lester. That argument made sense then and there had been no poverty, neuroscience of poverty uh, studies at all at that point. So I think Ryan's mistake here is to see this very compelling argument that we should broaden the assistance that we give to children with learning difficulties. Uh, that argument comes out of neuroscience. It doesn't. We could erase all of neuroscience and still make the argument the argument would stand or fall regardless of what neuroscience said. So I think this is a kind of particular example of a, a confusion that arises, a kind of exuberant confusion uh, that says that neuroscience tells us something that it doesn't really tell us at all. Yeah. So that brings us to your conclusion, which I'm going to read, uh, which is that research in this field has no unique practical payoff for reducing or alleviating poverty and its effects over and above, and this is what you were just saying, what is known or can be discovered from behavioral science and ordinary methods of social observation. So my first question is, who doesn't want to hear this? <coughs> well, <laughs> this is, by the way, the sort of second piece of my paper, which is, you know, leaving aside genes versus environment. Uh, the question is what neuroscience adds uh, to the behavioral observations that we already have made. 
and the difficulties of trying to manipulate social life. I mean, that's where the rubber meets the road is even if we know we need to reduce poverty, we have no clue as to how to really do it in an effective way. So who want, doesn't want to hear this? Well, I think a lot of people don't want to hear it. I mean, first of all, the people who do the neuroscience don't want to hear it because they recognize that their funding and you know their viability depends on the relevance uh, the pertinence of what they do in the sense of, you know, helping us with this intractable social problem that has been with us for a very long time and in some ways only seems to be getting worse. Uh, and the promise that they are going to assist us in addressing uh, the, the poverty problem, the disadvantage problem, and especially as it affects children, their capacities, their future, uh, that promise is so important to our willingness to support and fund that science, so that's, that's bad news for them. Um, I think also policymakers, people who believe that we ought to be devoting uh, more effort, more resources to addressing these problems and that we have the capacity to do it, that we, we can intervene uh, to, to change the course of these children's lives. Um, they think that science, the sort of imprimatur of science, uh, that their recommendations proceeding from this hard knowledge that science represents will give their ambitions more credibility and more force in the public mind. Uh, and I think that that always works to say science yes, says, is. science supports. I think that's a red flag, that phrase science says. Science says and science supports are uh, you know, our ideas about how we should structure preschool programs, you know, nutrition programs, parent advising programs, uh, mental health services, uh, you know, all of the, the initiatives, uh, nurse family cooperative initiatives, that, well, the whole litany, the whole laundry list of anti-poverty programs that we have tried, that we have proposed, that we have funded. Um, that really haven't worked all that well, but if we just redouble our efforts somehow with science behind it, it will. Um, I think that it's, it's so tempting uh, to, to talk that way. Right. And we want, we should add quickly, we want science to be behind right. our, our policy recommendations, but, but not, as you said before, <laughs> overclaiming, extravagant extrapolations from, from data sets that may be highly legitimate for what they intended to demonstrate, right. but that, that do not have the implications that people hope they do. Right, and I wouldn't say that science even undercut some of these claims. I would say that science is kind of orthogonal to these claims. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the science just shows us that poverty and disadvantage have effects. We already knew that in a way. I mean, when you put that together, with this, this insight that wherever there is a behavioral change, there's going to be a brain change, you know, under, underlying it, uh, that's, it confirms that. But it doesn't take us even one step further in trying to figure out what are the components of disadvantage that are the most egregious, uh, that, that are critical because disadvantage is a very complicated thing. It doesn't just have to do with no money. It has to do with neighborhoods, with parenting, with the home environment, with uh, values and assumptions and you know, cultural practices, uh, everything you can think of. Uh, so you know, neuroscience has nothing to say about which of those is the most important. Uh, and then that's on the cause side, on the cure side, of course, uh, we just do not know how to intervene to affect these complicated social conditions and behaviors. Uh, we've been trying forever, and once again, neuroscience literally has nothing to say about that. I mean, zero. Yeah, right. um, and, and most you're, as you said, usually talking about incremental validity, which is to say none in this case, that it doesn't add anything o over and above what we right. can discern. Well, we would know behavior. Could you imagine, and maybe I'll end with this, that you, could you imagine uh, that as the, uh, as, neuro as neuroscientific methodology itself it becomes refined over the years, that it, it, it might have useful con contributions to make? 
Well, I mean, there's that question I think really operates on two levels. The first level is one of just kind of no holds barred, you know, John Lennon imagine, right? Which is uh, there's no there's no limit to what we can imagine uh, science might accomplish, uh, and we can express the hope that there'll be you know, these massive paradigm shifts and changes uh, that we we just can't even see on the horizon. I mean, I can't sit here and say that will never happen. I will say, though, there are formidable practical obstacles, in part because the the methods that we you have used in the past to advance science, which are you know highly manipulative and interventionist uh, and intrusive, are, are very hard to use on human brains because we have these extremely formidable ethical uh, reservations about doing some of these things. So I think that is going to necessarily limit what we do. But you know we can imagine. On the other hand, if we're going to say, well. What, what can we anticipate now in any concrete way based on what we know? I think the answer is a blank. Uh, we really have no clue what it's going to look like. You know, we're, it's not just that we need to work toward getting there. We don't even have any vision of so it. So in a way, that's a, almost a hard problem. Is you can't even imagine what the answer looks like. We can't even like. imagine in that sense what, what the answer would well, look like. This problem yes. is hard enough, but it sounds like for now and maybe for the foreseeable and future, possibly forever, it will remain in the realm of social scientists and uh, behaviorists. But actually, let me just stress, and I think this is a really important part of my, uh, my paper and my thesis, is that the action here is going to be on the social and political and behavioral mm -hmm. side. I mean, that the understandings of the ability to, to do something about uh, you know, disadvantage and the effects of disadvantage. I mean, this is a social question, a pragmatic question, and, and a behavioral question. Uh, and, you know, what's often left out and what's often forgotten because we're so enamored of these top down, progressive, uh, programmatic approaches to social problems is that there's a whole nother set of perhaps more traditional, conventional approaches to. Uh, building strong families, building strong characters, laying the groundwork for human capital development that almost get left out of the picture. And I think this literature further rusticates those, those ideas because uh, it encourages a kind of technocratic approach uh, rather than a more um, traditional approach to the social problems that we encounter. Well, thank you, Amy Wax. That was just a masterful description of the state of this uh, area and its, its limitations and ending with some promise, I hope. Thank you. Thank you.